Today, I just wanted to discuss a really interesting concept, and that's the concept of transfer. First place I ever heard about transfer was in relation to the principle of specificity when you're talking about athletic development and training. And Mitch trained with Coach Ian King, who is the one that I uh, first heard it from. So uh, can you explain just exactly what the concept of the transfer continuum is? So transfer is a concept that Ian King um, came up with, and basically it means an activity that you do in training that will transfer to your sport or the thing you're wanting to do. Um, And there's a lot of confusion around that. And as Shian talked about, specificity often gets caught up in that. People think if they're going to do something that's specific, therefore it will transfer to game day, to match day, to race day, to on the field, whatever the activity in the dojo, in the octagon, um, whatever activity that you're doing. So transfer essentially means doing things that help your sport, that by playing your sport, you you, um, you won't get the benefits of. And I'll use an example because it's one of the biggest sports in the world is a 100-metre sprint, right? It's it's I think there's more or the, it's one of the activities in the, in the Olympics that more countries participate in than nearly any other sport. And basically, you'll see a lot of people training for 100 meter sprint, and they want to do their reps in the gym, just to use that example, fast, right? Because the legs turn over very fast, the joint velocity at the hips is really, really quick. So they try and mimic that. I'm training really specific, doing really fast squats, as an example. The reality is, though, it's not that specific because uh, the hip angle, the, the, the rate of the hip, of the legs moving is so much faster than you could ever get a mimic in the gym, as an example. So an, uh, another way that we've learned to get transfer into the sprint, particularly the start of the 100 meter sprint, might be to use a slow speed deadlift. And at first it seems weird, what, a slow speed deadlift? And the reason is that there's a number of reasons that that can help transfer to the start of the 100 meters really well. And a couple of reasons. Number one, the trunk angle at the start. Where are you? Here or are you here? You're bent over. And the start of a deadlift starts with a bent over trunk angle. The second thing, the ground contact time at the start of a 100 meter sprint is a lot longer than towards the end of the 100 meter sprint when you're at top speed. And the third thing is there's no, like Xian talks about the, the tendon reflex, the stretch shortening cycle. There's no stretch shortening cycle at the start of 100 meters. It's a purely concentric activity. Um, you're not even allowed, are they? No, they're not. You'll get disqualified if you try to take advantage of the stretch, stretch shortening cycle. Yeah. So there's nothing. And guess what? In a good deadlift, there's nothing. And the deadlift's an interesting exercise. It's got two words, dead, lift, right? A, a lift from a stop, from no momentum. Yet we see on Instagram and on the, in the, you know, on, on, t- on the internet these days, everyone doing deadlifts that are not deadlifts for reps. A deadlift means pause, stop, lose elastic energy momentum, and then go again. These bouncing deadlifts are not deadlifts, but they don't, you know, this is Instagram, right? That we're talking about. And the doesn't internet, matter. so it doesn't matter. You want to just look good, right? But the training effect of the, the, the it's actual- It's the 80-20. Yeah, only 20% of your audience know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's <laughs> but it. But the money comes from the 80. The 80%, <laughs> yeah. So that's an example of how something like a slow speed deadlift can potentially have a lot of transfer to a 100 meter sprint race, even though specificity wise, it probably doesn't look as specific as something some other exercises do. So hopefully I've done a good job of explaining what transfer is. Transfer doesn't always have to be specific. So can I also add something there is, The concept of somatic, somatic being a physical property, we talk about this a lot of training, somatics are the physical properties, speed, cardiovascular endurance, um, strength and flexibility are the four main um, somatics. And so training for an instructor is simply creating the right combination, balance, timing, and, and if you like, the order even of those somatics or the training aimed at those somatics to best optimise them for your sport. That's that right, well, absolutely. The problem is a lot of people get it so wrong. Yeah, you know? and you went through it a couple of weeks ago and it's from Ian's book, Foundations of Physical Preparation. There's a hot, there's a continuum of the somatics or what we call the physical qualities, um, strength, speed, flexibility, endurance, and they sit on a continuum um, of, in terms of specific, like a, of specificity, and the ones that, for example, from general to specific, from general to general specific. specific. That's yes. right. And the the general qualities on the general side transfer to the activity that you want a lot more. Whereas the specific qualities, um, specifically endurance and then speed, next on the continuum, they need to be highly specific to what you're doing because you can be the greatest marathon runner in the world, 
but it's not going to help you win the Tour de France. Even exactly. though they're both high endurance activities, they don't transfer. That the central adaptations you get transfer, but the specific adaptations at the muscle level don't transfer one bit. And I see that in martial arts too. You get guys who can really hang in there tough in a Kyokushin style tournament that don't last four or five minutes in a role oh, yeah. in grappling. Oh, absolutely. Because the nature of the uh, muscle use and, and endurance and, and all that is so different. It's exactly the same as rugby. Like you look at rugby, I've worked with some great rugby, rugby league players, and then you take them surfing, for example, and in two minutes their arms are burning out yeah. from paddling, whereas you get a surfer on a rugby field and he's going to die. He yeah. or she's going to die because of the contact. So it's those things um, require specific uh, really, bodies. really worth looking into, studying. Look up Coach Ian King and his work, specifically that that book, uh, Preparation for the Foundations of Foundations Physical Preparation. Physical Preparation. That's a great book, and I've actually I've been reading it in the last couple of days. But the other thing, too, about that is, okay, we have this transfer continuum. Where does it fit in a general way? Flexibility is very, 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 very general. If you do a good solid uh, program of flexibility training so that you're working to open up all the main joints, that will transfer very, very nicely to pretty well any activity that you're doing. Of course, there's very specific flexibility work you can do as well. Then the next way along is certain types of strength training. So this is why you can do the Olympic um, speed lifts, the snatch and the clean and jerk, and you combine that with good, well-designed, bench press, squatting, deadlift, I would say. Yeah, you, want, yeah. you, you don't get, like you can go on forever and ever and ever, but if you narrow those down, uh, and then the next you come along there, then you start to get more specific, namely, but specifically, I would say speed, speed. is next. Yep. The nature of speed training, you know, the, the, the training you have to do to make your punch quick or make your kick quick is very different to the type of training that a sprinter would be doing, awesome. for example. Absolutely. And then right over in the in the very specific area is the, the um, energy use. Cardiovascular endurance might be a little bit misleading because yeah. you think it's all about, you know, but it's more about how you optimise the use of the energy system. We, we just body. call it endurance. Endurance, yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's good. Now, the purpose of today is, and I'm really appreciative of Mitch to come along and help because Mitch actually crosses the borders between that athletic development coach and someone who's trained because I actually came up with a really cool idea. You did? This morning. Another one. Yeah. This is this the second idea I've had in my <laughs> life. <laughs> the first one went pretty well too. I was thinking in terms of transfer amongst the martial arts. Now, Masayama says in his book, This is Karate, that pretty well all the martial arts in Japan originate in the same place, what they call taijutsu. Taijutsu literally means the body arts, okay? And out of taijutsu was born aiki jujitsu, jujitsu, aikido, and then you have tempo, and then you have the karate, and then you have judo, which is jujitsu. And all they are, the only thing that differentiate, differentiates one martial art from another is the range that they choose to focus on. So, for example, Taekwondo is basically, if you want to win a gold medal in the Olympics, 90% range one, the kicks, and maybe 10% range two, the punches. Kyokushin is more, it depends on the individual, but you, let's say 50% kicks, range one, 50% punches, range two. Okay, And then you look at Muay Thai. Muay Thai is 40% kicks, 40% punches, 20% grapple and elbows. I'm just making these numbers up. I haven't done research, but you get the picture. The thing that differentiates them is the choice of techniques in the ranges. Look at boxing, 90% range two punches, but when they're tired and sore, they'll get in and they'll go to range four and, and lock up, okay? Then you look at judo. Judo is 90% or 80% stand up because that's what wins the gold medals. It was very different until 1964 when they introduced judo in the Olympics and they, the rules changed. Pre-Olympic judo, rules going back 100 years, the rounds were like 20 minutes and there was no time limit on the ground. Okay, When it got to the Olympics, the Olympic Committee said, you're going to have to do something about that. It's kind of boring. So it went from 20 minutes to 20 seconds. Okay, And then, of course, people start to go, well, what can I do to win a gold medal? It's all in the throws. 
so they win the gold medal by the throws. Even if that throw compromises their position and against a good grappler would have got them choked out or something, certain throws are very dangerous uh, if you're allowed to continue it onto the, the mat. So they're 90% stand-up grappling and 10% on the ground. Whereas you look at um, wrestling, freestyle wrestling, it's probably more 50% stand-up grappling and 50% on the ground because you win the matches by pinning them. Okay, and then you look at BJJ, BJJ is like 10% stand-up grappling and 90% on the ground. So it's interesting how different martial arts are simply categorizable by the ranges that they choose. But this is where I was thinking about transfer. It's so interesting that there are certain principles, concepts and ideas that transfer from one system to another very, very well. And one of the things I think that has been really useful for me as I do more grappling is certain principles of Kokushin. Um, and we thought we'd show you a couple of those today in terms of the transfer. Okay, so let's see if we can get this set up a bit. For example, let's work the idea. Can you see us there? Yeah, that's pretty good. I'll try to speak loudly because I know that when I step away from the mic, it's not as loud. So, do you need to warm up? Good. So, I'm here and he throws a head kick at me. My cock's comb. Remember, if my hand is here, I get knocked out. If I have a glove on, it's different. So there again, the rules of the game determine the style. If I have kickboxing gloves on and my hand is here, I'll block that kick. But in Kogashin, that would still knock me out. So I have to come up here, like a cock's comb. So now he throws the kick. There's a cox cone. Again, there's a cox cone. We call it the cox cone, like that. Okay? Now, if he throws a body kick, what I like to do is bury my elbow in the body. Okay? I can't block a body kick with my arm like that because my body's in the way. You can if your timing's good. But the reality is, like in here, I want to block it by burying my elbow and bury my head six sides of the seat. So back here, when he throws the body kick, I can't afford to have my hip bone and my elbow separate. Because if there's one inch, you'll find them to find the hole. Okay, so the principle is elbows welded, arrow lighted, glued, stuck, sticky taped. Am I getting a point across? To the body. So now he throws boom, and I'm this hand comes up just in case it's tricky, like that. I want to make sure my head is buried. Okay, that's another point about it. A leg check. When I do a thigh kick, when Miss does a thigh kick at me, I don't want to block it by coming away. We know the way I drop the leg. I wedge my body into it. There's a couple of ways you can do it. One, I turn the nerve in the side of the leg away from the line of the kick, and I take my body into that kick, whoops, not like that, all right? So you can throw the kick, I wedge into it. Another way is, I don't know where the kick's going, it could be body, could be, uh, could be leg, could be body, could be head. So I'm gonna cover them all by connecting my elbow and knee there. So I don't know whether it's gonna be a leg kick, a body kick, or a thigh kick, so what I'm going to do is make sure I cover them all by connecting my elbow and knee. You see that? Um, well, they're just good examples. Yeah. So let's have a look at a couple of interesting things here. This is where the idea of transfer across the fighting systems came up with me. For example, well, I didn't rehearse a couple of these with Mitch, but let's just say... I'm on the ground here, okay, and Mitch starts to apply a choke. So let's say he's in the mount, classic grappling position, and he starts to put on a cross choke. See that? So he gets the arm in there, comes around, and what? applies the choke. It's really much shorter. So let's work the idea of the cox comb. So as soon as he gets his hand in there, I go cox comb. See that? Now the cops home, remember, you want to have this metacarpal a 
above the forehead. Okay? The same principle against the choke. If I have my hand too low, even as it puts the choke on, I end up choking myself. Okay? So what I can do, and this is good if you're not used to grappling and you want to know how to deal with these chokes, the first thing you do is then it puts like a rope box cone. See, like that, let's turn around a bit so it's more visible to the camera. So there. So we're in the mouth, and he starts to put the choke on. Look, I come up here, box cone. Sometimes he's already got that buried down. I can't get the hand I need to create space to get it in. And now, look, I do the cox cone, I can walk my hand above the head, and I can clear his arm. And if you want, you can capture that arm and start to work on bridge escapes. Okay. So the whole idea of a bridge escape to get out of this position is I'm going to make sure I capture his arm like this, squeeze it in tight, I even like to do this because it cuts down the opportunity for him to throw a punch. I can bite and all that sort of stuff too. But look, and then from there, come up, and then I can start to take the mark. But in terms of using the cox cone, okay, so we just throw the hip while I'm sitting down. Boom, oh, there's the cox cone right there. Now, in the cross choke, let's go this way so you can see, he puts that choke on, the first thing I do is I go cox cone, like I'm reading, I'm listening to the telephone. And even if he tries to continue, I crawl my hand above my head and clear. And I can even get this tricep push there. Okay, that's a really good example of that. Um, another one, I say that, another one is there's a position in BJJ called the Della Hiva Guard. Created by a guy called Champion named Della Hiva. Where a guard is anything where your legs are involved in preventing him from coming on top. So this is a guard. These are all guard works. Yeah. And Della Hiva is simply the leg comes around and hooks his leg like that. And it's, you get a good bite, especially if you grab here, and then you start to pull it down and you're in this position. It's a very strong position. And what would you do to get out of it? Well, um, you, you kind of get stuck until you think in terms of blocking a leg check. Because remember, the force of the Della Hiva is that you're you're weaving your leg in and out. So what you can do is, as they put the Della Hiva on, you simply do a leg check. Watch what happens. He turns his foot out, and, boom, and my leg check is gone. My Della Hiva is gone. Come back. There's my Della Hiva. I have it hooked. My foot comes around and hooks around his thigh. It's called the Della Hiva, right there. You can do some crazy things. Not going to look as the hard surface. Thank you. There. Okay? So simply to unwind the Della Hiva, a lot of BJJ guys don't even know this. Unwind the Della Hiva, simply do a leg check. Boom! My leg comes off, and then he, he takes his leg, passes it, and then he's already passed it down. Okay? So that's another example of transfer from a body shape that you're familiar with in karate, you transfer it to your BJJ. Okay? Another important point is we talked about defending the body, the, the kick with the elbow, knee, and as he throws a kick, boom, and I'm blocking it like that. Okay? On the ground, one of the most useful principles is connecting your elbow and knee. And here's an example of it. I'm lying down, which is inside control here. Let's turn around this way a little bit. Okay? So I have to create space between Mitch and me. So what I'm going to do is get a wedge in, create some space, and look, bring that knee in. Now, if Mitch wants to get away, stand up and go away for a sec. Look at my position. I've connected my knee an elbow, just like I would be blocking a, a kick. So that creates the barrier just the same as blocking the kick creates the barrier by connecting my knee and elbow. It's not as effective if they're separated, even just a couple of inches, so I have to come in. So now, when Mitch is inside control, I create some space, I create a little bit of a wedge in between, and I bring my knee in, and look, 
I can act negative if Mitch tries to drop that hip down and make it hard for me, as long as I can continue to get my knee and elbow together, then I can use my knee to create space, coming back to here if I want, or what I'd like to do is punch my knuckles into the clavicles, keep that arm stiff, and back away. Okay? That's another good example. The other example which I really love is the importance of the elbow on the body. For example, if I held Mitch in what's called Kesagatame, okay? Put your head that way and you think that way just a bit. Sorry, put your feet here. So this is called Kesagatame. Why is it called that? Gatame means katame, means a hold down. The Kesa, you know, there's some Buddhist monks that kind of wear those robes and they go around and they have one side comes down and off it. Well, that's called the Kesa. It's like a scarf. Okay? So just move that way a bit. So this is Kesa the Tame. Okay? You come in under, elevate the shoulder, come in here. My hands here. People argue that he can push my head and hook his foot over the top. And if I'm weak, yes, you can do that. So the reality is a good Kesa is down here, like I'm trying to whisper something in his ear, like, you're in big trouble now. <laughs> okay? Now, here's the golden rule of Kesa to come. If you've never done a Kesa, but you get caught in Kesa, there is one thing that you have to do, and that is get this elbow to the mat. Okay? So it doesn't matter what you do. Right now I'm sitting my weight on the floor because I'm trying to be nice because Mitch is helping me. And so Mitch says the alphabet out loud. A, B, C, D. Okay, there's no pressure on Listen what happens when I do the Kesa properly. He says the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. There's hardly any change in position from your perspective, but from Mitch's perspective it's like, I'm not going to get to the end of the alphabet because the pressure is crazy. And I would even actually adjust it from here. So now he puts the alphabet on. A, B, C, D, E. It's horrible. Well, so his relief is simply get this elbow in short, explosive movements to the mat. Boop, 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 boop. Once he has that elbow down, I have zero control of his body shape. So then he can come up behind me and continue from there, okay? That's simply putting that elbow on the ground. In the same way, whenever we're in a grappling situation, uh, if I can remember to glue my elbows to the body, you do away with 90% of the problems you'll ever have. So for example, the turtle position. I love this turtle position. People in grappling see it as a very passive defensive position because they're taught to cover the neck. Now Mitch, if I was here, what would you do? The first thing he did was get an underhook. Okay, there's a hole here. But if I think in terms of arrow guiding my elbows to my body when I come in here, now, where does Mitch go? He can't get that underhook. And 90% of all grappling techniques that are taught to deal with the turtle, 99% require, have a seat, require getting the underhook. So, but if your elbows are arrow guided to your body, they can't get the underhook. So that's, what's Harry? Dino, thanks for coming along. Hey Brad, how are you man? Sorry for your loss. Brad lost one of his best buddies recently, Professor Keith Owen, one of the best uh, well-known US BJJ instructors. That's sad. A fourth degree under the great Pedro Sauer had a very sudden and sad uh, passing. But anyway, um, good to see you, Brad. So anyway, look, the principle of transfer in terms of somatics, we talk about the degree to which the training you are doing transfers to usefulness in the sport you do. Is that a fair description? Yes. In, in terms of martial arts, which is the idea that I just played with this morning, transfer is the usefulness of certain principles and body shapes 
across from one range and one martial art to another. Okay, us, we're too, it's good to see you. Okay, so good coxcomb if you're a karate guy. In fact, I remember once I was rolling, training with um, Dan Henderson. Dan Henderson, great UFC fighter. Uh, we did a bit of training together. Clearly, I learned a lot more from him than he learned from me. But there was one thing that he uh, was getting caught because when he was on the ground, guys were catching his hands and he couldn't free them. And he wanted to know what to do. So I just showed him a karate wrist escape, which um, he liked. Whether he ever used it or not is a different thing. But he, he drilled, we drilled that one day. Okay, so, um, and... You know, Dan Henderson's a silver medalist in the Olympics in wrestling, one of the great US wrestlers and a multiple UFC champion. So I don't have all the answers for him. But that one particular day and that one particular role, he was getting caught with a guy holding his wrists and we just used a, a normal standard karate wrist break. And uh, so that is another example of transfer. So what do you reckon, Mitch? Am I onto something? I think so, absolutely. Write a book? Yeah, definitely write a book. <laughs> Anyway, look, I think that's what I wanted to talk about today. If you have certain principles from your martial art and you, you take an interest in another martial art, you'll be surprised how the fundamental rules, good default position, elbows are in. Okay, when you're grappling, the number one rule is keep your elbows in. Okay, a good cox comb will stop you from getting knocked out. When they choke you, get that cox comb in and... Like I find myself automatically when I find myself in side control on the mat, we'll show you what I mean. So if, in, if I'm in this position here, side control, and Mitch starts to come on top in side control, the first thing I do is I go box home. I go hand right here. So come away from me, Mitch. See where my hand is? I get that ready because... Without that there, he has access to my neck and he can put a lot of pressure on it. Okay? But with that here, now I've created a little bit of a wedge. A wedge is a new word that they're using in DJJ. John Manor who introduced it, I'm sure. Yeah. That's what I first heard. But it's a really good word because what I'm doing is I'm creating a wedge between Mitch and head and my head. And from there now, this hand, move away, this hand. I can literally start to do that and create space. So now when Mitch comes into side control, one, ooh, and then I have that wedge right there. And then from there I can bring this in, and then I can start to create space. And on the on the ground, uh, on the ground space is your friend if you're being attacked. Definitely space is friend. So using those principles, cox comb. That wedge in like this, cox comb here, elbow, knee and elbow connection. That's a golden one. They're really, really useful principles that transfer from one fighting system, completely divorced in terms of ranges and, and techniques, but the principles remain the same. I've heard you say a lot too, in footwork, the hips, hip movement in grappling is the same as footwork on the feet. Exactly. Which is another, I guess, transfer. Yeah, that's true. There you go. Because... Um, as you know, no technique works if you don't have the footwork to bridge the gap. But bridging the gap and creating the gap on the ground is hip movement. So I wrote in the book here, hip movement is the footwork of the grappler. And that's really very important. So anyway, thanks guys for coming along. I hope you enjoyed that. We're going to stop there. Um, if you've got any comments, please, uh, when I put the video up, make sure you leave a comment. And also... I know all of you have subscribed in 15 different aliases <laughs> and 20 different countries, and we're just trying to get it up. So I'm trying to get my subscriber base up from what it is to about 20 million. So I've only got about another 19,998,500 <laughs> to go. <laughs> but anyway, uh, keep that in mind, guys. The principle of transfer, not only in using, using the principle in terms of the transfer continuum for somatic training, but also when you go from one fighting system to another, don't abandon 
your principles because they'll hold solid across all ranges. Us, thanks guys, appreciate it very much and look forward to seeing you next week. Us, thanks for coming. See you then. Thanks, Mitch. Us, thank you. Us. We're going for a swim.